Title Arsen Lupin Author Edgar Jepson Arsen Lupin by Edgar Jepson and Maurice LeBlanc Chapter 12 The theft of the pendant they stood round the millionaire observing his anguish with eyes in which shone various degrees of sympathy as if no longer able to bear the sight of such woe Sonia slipped out of the room the millionaire lamented his loss and abused the thieves by turns but always at the top of his magnificent voice suddenly a fresh idea struck him he clapped his hand to his brow and cried that 800 pounds charley will never buy the mercrack now he was not a bona fide purchaser the duke's lips parted slightly and his eyes opened a trifle wider than their wont he turned sharply on his heel and almost sprang into the other drawing room there he laughed at his ease m formery kept saying to the millionaire be calm m gorney martin be calm we shall recover your masterpieces i pledge you my word all we need is time have patience be calm his soothing remonstrances at last had their effect the millionaire grew calm guachard he said where is guachard m formery presented guachard to him are you on their track have you a clue said the millionaire i think said m formery in an impressive tone that we may now proceed with the inquiry in the ordinary way He was a little piqued by the millionaire's so readily turning from him to the detective. He went to a writing table, set some sheets of paper before him, and prepared to make notes on the answers to his questions. The duke came back into the drawing room. The inspector was summoned. M. Gorney Martin sat down on a couch with his hands on his knees and gazed gloomily at M. Formerly, Jermain who was sitting on a couch near the door waiting with an air of resignation for her father to cease his lamentations rose and moved to a chair nearer the writing table guachard kept moving restlessly about the room but noiselessly at last he came to a standstill leaning against the wall behind m formery m formery went over all the matters about which he had already questioned the duke He questioned the millionaire and his daughter about the charale, the theft of the motor cars, and the attempted theft of the pendant. He questioned them at less length about the composition of their household, the servants and their characters. He elicited no new fact. He paused and then he said, carelessly as a mere matter of routine, "I should like to know, M. Gorney Martin." If there has ever been any other robbery committed at your house, three years ago the scoundrel Lupin, the millionaire, began violently. Yes, yes, I know all about that earlier burglary. But have you been robbed since? Said M. Formerly, interrupting him. No, I haven't been robbed since that burglary. But my daughter has. Said the millionaire. Your daughter? Said M. Formerly, yes, I have been robbed two or three times during the last three years," said Jermain. "Dear me, but you ought to have told us about this before. This is extremely interesting and most important," said M. Formerly, rubbing his hands. "I suppose you suspect Waktwa? No, I don't," said Jermain quickly. "It couldn't have been Waktwa." The last two thefts were committed at the chateau when Waktwa was in Paris in charge of this house. M. Formerly seemed taken aback and he hesitated, consulting his notes. Then he said, "Good, good. That confirms my hypothesis." "What hypothesis?" said M. Gorney Martin quickly. "Never mind, never mind," said M. Formerly solemnly and turning to Germain he went on you say madame vazel that these thefts began about 3 years ago yes i think they began about 3 years ago in august let me see 
It was in the month of August, three years ago, that your father, after receiving a threatening letter like the one he received last night, was the victim of a burglary? said M. For Marie, yes, it was the scoundrels, cried the millionaire fiercely. Well, it would be interesting to know which of your servants entered your service three years ago, said M. For Marie, Waktwa has only been with us a year at the outside, said Jermain. Only a year? said M. For Marie quickly, with an air of some vexation. He paused and added, exactly, exactly. And what was the nature of the last theft of which you were the victim? It was a pearl brooch, not unlike the pendant which His Grace gave me yesterday, said Jermaine. Would you mind showing me that pendant? I should like to see it, said M. For Marie, certainly, show it to him. Jacques, you have it, haven't you? said Jermaine, turning to the Duke. Me, no, how should I have it? said the Duke in some surprise. Haven't you got it? I've only got the case, the empty case, said Jermaine. With a startled air, the empty case, said the Duke, with growing surprise. Yes, said Jermaine, it was after we came back from our useless journey to the station. I remembered suddenly that I had started without the pendant. I went to the bureau and picked up the case. And it was empty. One moment, one moment, said M. For Marie, didn't you catch this young Bernard Charolais with this case in his hands? Your Grace? Yes, said the Duke. I caught him with it in his pocket. Then you may depend upon it that the young rascal had slipped the pendant out of its case and you only recovered the empty case from him, said M. For Marie triumphantly. No, said the Duke. That is not so. Nor could the thief have been the burglar who broke open the bureau to get at the keys. For long after both of them were out of the house I took a cigarette from the box which stood on. The bureau beside the case which held the pendant. And it occurred to me that the young rascal might have played that very trick on me. I opened the case and the pendant was there. It has been stolen, cried the millionaire. Of course it has been stolen. Oh, no, no, said the duke. It hasn't been stolen. Irma, or perhaps Mademoiselle Krichnov, has brought it to Paris for Germain. Sonia certainly hasn't brought it. It was she who suggested to me that you had seen it lying on the bureau. And slipped it into your pocket, said Germain quickly. Then it must be Irma, said the duke. We had better send for her and make sure, said M. For Marie, Inspector, go and fetch her. The inspector went out of the room and the Duke questioned Germain and her. Farther about the journey, whether it had been very uncomfortable, and if they were very tired by it, he learned that they had been so fortunate as to find sleeping compartments on the train so that they had suffered as little as might be from their night of travel. M. Formery looked through his notes. Guachard seemed to be going to sleep where he stood against the wall. The inspector came back with Irma. She wore the frightened, half-defensive, half-defiant air which people of her class wear when confronted by the authorities. Her big, cow's eyes rolled uneasily. Oh. Irma, Jermaine began. M. For Marie cut her short, somewhat brusquely. Excuse me, excuse me, I am conducting this inquiry, he said. And then, turning to Irma, he added, Now, don't be frightened, Mademoiselle Irma, I want to ask you a question or two. Have you brought up to Paris the pendant which the Duke of Chamuris gave your mistress yesterday? Me. Sir, no, sir, I haven't brought the pendant, said Irma. You're quite sure, said M. For Marie, yes, sir, I haven't seen the pendant. Didn't Mademoiselle Germain leave it on the bureau? said Irma. How do you know that? 
said M. For Marie, I heard Madame Vazelle Germain say that it had been on the bureau. I thought that perhaps Madame Vazelle Krichnov had put it in her bag. Why should Madame Vazelle Krichnov put it in her bag? said the Duke quickly. To bring it up to Paris for Madame Vazelle Germain, said Irma. But what made you think that? said Guachard, suddenly intervening. Oh, I thought Madame Vazelle Krichnov might have put it in her bag because I saw her standing by the bureau, said Irma. Ah, and the pendant was on the bureau? said M. For Marie. Yes, sir, said Irma. There was a silence. Suddenly the atmosphere of the room seemed to have become charged with an oppression, a vague menace. Guachard seemed to have become wide awake again. Germain and the Duke looked at one another uneasily. Have you been long in the service of Mademoiselle Gournay Martin? said M. For Marie. Six months. Sir, said Irma. Very good. Thank you. You can go, said M. For Marie. I may want you again presently. Irma went quickly out of the room with an air of relief. M. For Marie scribbled a few words on the paper before him and then said, Well, I will proceed to question Mademoiselle Krichnov. Mademoiselle Krichnov is quite above suspicion, said the Duke quickly. Oh, yes, quite, said Germain. How long has Mademoiselle Krichnov been in your service? Mademoiselle, said Guachard. Let me think, said Germain. Knitting her brow. Can't you remember? said M. For Marie. Just about three years, said Germain. That's exactly the time at which the thefts began, said M. For Marie. Yes, said Germain, reluctantly. Ask Madame Vazelle Krichnov to come here. Inspector, said M. For Marie. Yes, sir, said the inspector. I'll go and fetch her, I know where to find her, said the Duke quickly. Moving toward the door. Please, please, your grace, protested Guachard. The inspector will fetch her. The Duke turned sharply and looked at him. I beg your pardon. But do you, he said. Please don't be annoyed. Your grace, Guachard interrupted. But M. Formery agrees with me, it would be quite irregular. Yes, yes, your grace, said M. Formery, we have our method of procedure. It is best to adhere to it, much the best it is the result of years of experience of the best way. Of getting the truth, just as you please said the duke shrugging his shoulders the inspector came into the room mademoiselle krichnov will be here in a moment she was just going out she was going out said m for marie you don't mean to say you're letting members of the household go out no sir said the inspector i mean that she was just asking if she might go out m for Marie beckoned the inspector to him, and said to him in a voice too low for the others to hear, Just slip up to her room and search her trunks. There is no need to take the trouble, said Guachard, in the same low voice, but with sufficient emphasis. No, of course not. There's no need to take the trouble, M. For Marie repeated after him. The door opened, and Sonia came in. She was still wearing her traveling costume, and she carried her cloak on her arm. She stood looking round her with an air of some surprise. Perhaps there was even a touch of fear in it. The long journey of the night before did not seem to have dimmed at all her delicate beauty. The Duke's eyes rested on her in an inquiring, wondering, even searching gaze. She looked at him, and her own eyes fell. Will you come a little nearer? Mademoiselle, said M. For Marie, there are one or two questions, will you allow me? said Guachard, in a tone of such deference that it left M. For Marie no grounds for refusal. M. For Marie flushed and ground his teeth. Have it your own way. 
he said ungraciously. Mademoiselle Krichnov said Guachard in a tone of the most good-natured courtesy. There is a matter on which M. Formery needs some information. The pendant which the Duke of Chamiras gave Mademoiselle Gournay Martin yesterday has been stolen. Stolen? Are you sure? said Sonia in a tone of mingled surprise and anxiety. Quite sure, said Guachard. We have exactly determined the conditions under which the theft was committed. But we have every reason to believe that the culprit, to avoid detection, has hidden the pendant in the traveling bag or trunk of somebody else in order to, my bag is upstairs in my bedroom. Sir, Sonia interrupted quickly. Here is the key of it. In order to free her hands to take the key from her wrist bag, she set her cloak on the back of a couch. It slipped off it and fell to the ground at the feet of the Duke, who had not returned to his place beside Germain, while she was groping in her bag for the key, and all eyes were on her. The Duke, who had watched her with a curious intentness ever since her entry into the room, stooped quietly down and picked up the cloak. His hand slipped into the pocket of it. His fingers touched a hard object wrapped in tissue paper. They closed round it, drew it from the pocket, and, sheltered by the cloak, transferred it to his own. He set the cloak on the back of the sofa, and very softly moved back to his place by Germain's side. No one in the room observed the movement. Not even Guachard. He was watching Sonia too intently. Sonia found the key, and held it out to Guachard. He shook his head and said, There is no reason to search your bag, none whatever. Have you any other luggage? She shrank back a little from his piercing eyes, almost as if their gaze scared her. Yes, my trunk. It's upstairs in my bedroom too. Open. She spoke in a faltering voice, and her troubled eyes could not meet those of the detective. You were going out, I think, said Guachard gently. I was asking leave to go out. There is some shopping that must be done, said Sonia. You do not see any reason why Mademoiselle Krichnov should not go out. M. Formery, do you, said Guachard. Oh, no, none whatever. Of course she can go out, said M. For Marie, Sonia turned round to go. One moment, said Guachard. Coming forward, you've only got that wrist bag with you? Yes, said Sonia. I have my money and my handkerchief in it. And she held it out to him. Guachard's keen eyes darted into it. And he muttered, no point in looking in that. I don't suppose anyone would have had the audacity, and he stopped. Sonia made a couple of steps toward the door, turned, hesitated, came back to the couch, and picked up her cloak. There was a sudden gleam in Guachard's eyes, a gleam of understanding, expectation, and triumph. He stepped forward, and holding out his hands, said, Allow me, no, thank you said Sonia. I'm not going to put it on. No, but it's possible. Someone may have. Have you felt in the pockets of it? That one. Now, it seems as if that one, he pointed to the pocket which had held the packet. Sonia started back with an air of utter dismay. Her eyes glanced wildly round the room as if seeking an avenue of escape. Her fingers closed convulsively on the pocket. But this is abominable. She cried. You look as if, I beg you. Mademoiselle, interrupted Guachard. We are sometimes obliged, really. Mademoiselle Sonia, broke in the Duke. In a singularly clear and piercing tone. I cannot see why you should object to this mere formality. Oh, but, but, gasped Sonia raising her terror-stricken eyes to his. The Duke seemed to hold them with his own. And he said in the same clear, piercing voice, There isn't the slightest reason for you to be frightened. Sonia let go of the cloak, 
and Guachard, his face all alight with triumph, plunged his hand into the pocket, he drew it out empty, and stared at it, while his face fell to an utter, amazed blankness, nothing, nothing, he muttered under his breath, and he stared at his empty hand as if he could not believe his eyes. By a violent effort he forced an apologetic smile on his face, and said to Sonia, a thousand apologies, mademoiselle, he handed the cloak to her. Sonia took it and turned to go. She took a step towards the door, and tottered. The duke sprang forward and caught her as she was falling. Do you feel faint? He said in an anxious voice. Thank you, you just saved me in time, muttered Sonia. I'm really very sorry, said Guachard. Thank you, it was nothing, I'm all right now, said Sonia, releasing herself from the duke's supporting arm. She drew herself up, and walked quietly out of the room. Guachard went back to M. Formery at the writing table. You made a clumsy mistake there. Guachard, said M. Formery, with a touch of gratified malice in his tone. Guachard took no notice of it. I want you to give orders that nobody leaves the house without my permission, he said. In a low voice. No one except Mademoiselle Krichnov. I suppose, said M. Formery, smiling. She less than anyone, said Guachard quickly. I don't understand what you're driving at a bit, said M. Formery, unless you suppose that Mademoiselle Krichnov is Lupin in disguise. Guachard laughed softly. You will have your joke. M. Formery, he said. Well, well. I'll give the order, said M. Formery, somewhat mollified by the tribute to his humor, he called the inspector to him and whispered a word in his ear. Then he rose and said, I think, gentlemen, we ought to go and examine the bedrooms, and, above all, make sure that the safe in M. Gorney Martin's bedroom has not been tampered with. I was wondering how much longer we were going to waste time here talking about that stupid pendant, grumbled the millionaire. And he rose and led the way. There may also be some jewel cases in the bedrooms, said M. Formery, there are all the wedding presents. They were in charge of Waktua, said Jermaine quickly. It would be dreadful if they had been stolen. Some of them are from the first families in France. They would replace them. Those paper knives, said the Duke. Smiling, Jemaine and her father led the way. M. Formery, Guachard, and the inspector followed them. At the door the Duke paused, stopped, closed it on them softly. He came back to the window, put his hand in his pocket and drew out the packet wrapped in tissue paper. He unfolded the paper with slow, reluctant fingers, and revealed the pendant. This is the end of chapter 12. This book is split into chapters for viewer benefit. For next chapter click the suggested video or link in the description. Please subscribe for more of such amazing audiobooks. Play the playlist given in the description for autoplay of the entire book.